Hello everybody. Well today I'm starting a new series, new sermon series, new Bible teaching series. And uh, this series is going to show you that almost everything you believe is not true. It's going to show you that the most basic things that you believe the Bible teaches, the Bible does not teach. To show you the most fundamental things that you believe about Christianity are simply not biblical. The problem is that a lot of things are snuck into Christian religion from the outside. And the primary source of these sneaky things is Greek philosophy, Greek religion. You see, in between the Old Testament time and the time Jesus came, there was about 400 years. And these were the years where Alexander the Great conquered much of the world. And the Greek philosophy, the Greek culture became dominant in the Mediterranean area from Northern Africa through the Middle East and into Europe. The Greek philosophy, the Greek religion, the Greek teachings about the nature of humanity, the Greek beliefs about life after death, the myths, the gods and goddesses, all these things snuck into Christian teaching and Christian philosophy. Some of your early Christian theologians actually admitted that they were purposefully bringing Greek religion into Christianity and mixing it together. So many, many of the things that you believe are not from the Bible. They're basically from the paganism of the Greek religion and the Greek philosophy. So it's going to be a series, you know, one little subject each week. And I hope you'll open your mind. I hope you'll open your heart. Most of us have what we call confirmation bias. We take what we already believe and everything that we see seems to confirm what we already believe. If I told you that people that drive minivans are horrible drivers, you might go out that week and just really start noticing people in minivans driving poorly. And that would maybe confirm the statement that they're bad drivers just because you're looking for it to happen. I could have said that drivers of um, yellow pickup trucks are bad drivers. And you might notice that. But we always want to confirm what we already believe. When people read the Bible, they confirm what they already believe, even if it's not saying anything like that. You can read a verse that contradicts exactly what you believe, and yet you're going to think that it confirms what you believe because you have confirmation bias. What I did when I started studying the Bible, well, I've always studied the Bible my whole life, but at a certain point when I was an adult, I said, wait a minute, I'm going to clear my mind. I'm going to try to forget everything I believe. And I'm going to take some subjects, and I'm going to go in the Bible and start from cover to cover, and I want to find out what the Bible actually says about these subjects. And I was able to do that, and I changed my beliefs in many, many areas of life. And I hope that you have an open mind, not open to the world, not open to conspiracies or opinions, but open to what the Word of God actually says. If you're able to hear the things I'm teaching in the next weeks and take them in and do some studies of your own, don't listen to preachers, don't listen to anybody, just look into the Bible itself and see what it says. And a perfect example of this confirmation bias and the twisted theology that most Christians have, the most famous Bible verse in the world, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everybody takes that verse, and know what they say it means? It means if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to live forever in hell and be tortured in fire for all eternity. Because you're immortal. You'll never die. You're going to live forever, either in heaven or hell. So make your choice today. Because you, an eternal being, will never die. You will be in hell being tortured forever. But if you believe in Jesus, you're going to go to heaven when you die. And you're going to live forever in bliss and happiness with God. That's not what that verse says. That verse is very, very clear. There's two choices given in that verse. You can receive Jesus Christ and receive the gift of eternal life. If you don't receive Jesus Christ, you do not have eternal life. The other option given in that verse is to perish 
Perish means to die. When did the word perish turn into something else? When did it turn into being tortured forever and never dying and living for all eternity? That God would sustain your life miraculously in a place we call hell, which isn't a biblical concept at all. And that God would sustain you so that he could torture you forever? What kind of person would do that? I wouldn't do that to my worst enemy. I wouldn't do that to a child molester. I wouldn't do that to a murderer. I wouldn't do that to a thief. What kind of God do we want to believe in? What kind of God do we believe in? When we twist the scriptures, we come up with a violent, angry, mean, evil God. And that's not the God I believe in. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, not die but have everlasting life. You can have everlasting life through Jesus Christ, or you can choose the option. And that is not to live forever. That is to die and cease to exist. This is what the Bible teaches over and over. Look at another very famous verse. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And once again, I've heard preachers get up and preach this verse, and let's hear what it means. It means that you're gonna to go to hell and live forever in torture versus go to heaven and live forever in heaven. That's not what that verse says. The verse says the wages of sin, what you deserve as a sinner. Bible says we're all sinners, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. What we deserve, our payment, our wages is death. Because the Bible says over and over, Old and New Testament, that the wages of sin is death. The result of sin is death not torture. When did the word death start to mean torture? Forever, in eternity. Death means death. It's the end of life. It's just that simple. The Bible says this dozens and dozens of times. But the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is what? The gift of God is eternal life. Eternal life is something that you can receive and you can have. God gives it to you as a gift. It's not something you're naturally born with. The many who believe that people live eternally, that all people live eternally, that all people cannot die, then you've got to send them somewhere when they die. Then you send them to a burning fiery hell or you send them to a perfect bliss in heaven. The Bible never says that people go to heaven when they die. The Bible never says that people go to hell and burn and torture when they die. Those statements are nowhere in the Bible. And yet there, these, these false truths, these, these false facts, these lies are preached from the pulpits over and over and over. I know when I was a kid, a preacher would come in and just want to scare you. Maybe it'd be the Sunday evening service, we'd be out of church around eight o'clock, it might be dark outside, we'd be driving home that night. Maybe we were teenagers at the time. And a preacher would get up and say, if you're driving home tonight, and you get in a car accident, which we all know is possible, and you die, which we all know is possible, where would you be? Where would you be tonight? Would you be in heaven or would you be in hell? And they try to scare you into receiving Jesus or believing their teachings. And these are all false teachings. Well, that's just introductory material. Today's sermon is basically about the immortality of the human soul, or I should say the fact that there is not an immortal human soul. Unless you're a Greek pagan, you might believe in the immortal soul. But if you are a Christian, a Bible believer, then you definitely do not want to believe in immortality for human beings. I got quite a few verses to share with you today. The first one is 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. God alone is immortal and lives in unapproachable light who no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Now look at that opening statement that God alone is immortal. If that was the only verse I had in the entire Bible to tell you that all human beings do not live forever, that would prove it right there from the God's word. God alone is immortal. Do you remember the story of Adam and Eve? They sinned against God, they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the one tree they were forbidden to eat from, and they fell into sin, and the world became cursed, and the curse of sin spread throughout the, the whole world, the universe. And remember at the end of that story, God kicks them out of the garden and puts all kinds of curses on them. 
and he puts an angel with a flaming sword to guard the entrance to the garden so they could not re-enter the garden. What was the reason? The Bible tells us that God set that angel there with a fiery sword to keep Adam and Eve from returning to the garden. The Bible tells us clearly what the reason was. The reason was this, so that they will not eat of the tree of life and become immortal like us. God knew if they ate of the tree of life, they would live forever. And they would live forever in this sinful fallen state. He didn't want them to be immortal. He didn't want humans to be like him. God alone is immortal, humans are not. And the angel with the fiery sword was stopping human beings from eating of the tree of life and becoming immortal. Adam and Eve were not immortal and neither are you or I. God alone is immortal. Genesis 6.3, so the Lord said, my spirit won't remain with humans forever because they are truly mortal. Right there in Genesis 6, that's the beginning of the flood story, the Noah and the ark story. And it says, my spirit won't remain with humans forever because they are truly mortal. You see, the spirit part of us called the spirit is the life-giving force of God. The word spirit can be translated breath and it can be translated spirit in the Bible. It's the same original word. Because the breath of God, the spirit of God, is what enlivens every living creature on this planet. When that spirit is withdrawn from you, you will die. The spirit is not your personality, it is not your brain, it is not your mind, it is not your soul. It is a life force that God puts in us to give us life. And when God says, my spirit won't remain with human beings forever, what he's saying is, when I withdraw that life force, they will not live forever. They will die. And he clearly says, because they, human beings, are truly mortal. This is from the very beginning of the Bible. And this truth is carried throughout the Bible that humans do not live forever but they are mortal beings that will die. Romans 1, 23. People exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being. Once again, the emphasis here, starting way back in Genesis and now in the New Testament, in Paul's letter to the Romans, that God is immortal. Exchange the glory of the immortal God for the images made to look like a mortal human being. This distinction is made throughout the Bible. Now what about a soul? Can a soul die? Well certainly, definitely a soul can die. We have James 5, 19. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. You can save someone's soul from death. When you receive Jesus Christ, you receive the gift of eternal life. Without Christ, your body, your soul dies. Your spirit is not really you, it's not a part of you. Like I said earlier, it's the life force that God gives to every breathing creature. But your soul and your body will die. You can save a soul from death. You wouldn't say that if a soul couldn't die. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, Jesus says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Fear him who can destroy both body and soul. That alone tells you that the body and the soul can both be destroyed. And they can be destroyed in hell. Hell. The Bible tells us at the end of time in the book of Revelation that hell itself is thrown into the lake of fire. Hell is not a place of fire. Hell is the resting place of the dead. Hell itself is thrown into the lake of fire. And what happens when that happens? You are destroyed. The word destroy, destruction, death is used over and over in the Bible when it comes to the ultimate uh, journey of the wicked that they will be destroyed and they will die. Here it says clearly, Fear him who was able to destroy both body and soul in hell. The body and soul will be destroyed, not sustained for eternity, but destroyed. Ezekiel 18.4 Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins, it shall die. The soul that sins, it shall die. If you die in your sins, 
you will not receive the gift of eternal life. That's what God offers you through Jesus Christ, his son. His son had to die and to resurrect from the dead to bring life to us. Ezekiel 18, 4. Behold, all souls are mine. Oh, yes, same verse. I guess a different translation. As the soul of the Father, so also the Son, the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sins it shall die. Ezekiel 18, 20. The soul that sins it shall die. I guess I typed it three times. It was that important. Okay, look at the next part here. The destiny of the wicked is death and destruction. Death, destruction. You know, if you take a branch of wood and you throw it into a fire, it doesn't sit there forever. It's burned up, it, it dies. Jesus talked about that. He said, if you're not producing good fruit, you're gonna be cut off and you're gonna be thrown into the fire. What happens when you're thrown into the fire? You're burned up, you're destroyed, you cease to exist, you die. It's that simple. How that ever got twisted into the branch is thrown into the fire, but it never burns up. It stays there forever, it keeps living, and it's being burned forever. That is not what happens when you throw something like that into a fire. Hebrews 6, 1 through 3. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward in maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. This is saying that this is so fundamental to Christian belief. These are the elementary teachings, he says. These are the beginning teachings, the first things that you need to know, and you've already learned, and you should know these things. And the one thing that he mentions here very clearly is the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. He didn't say from acts that lead to burning forever in a fiery hell and being tortured. He said death. Why do we, we've twisted these things over the years and preached the false teachings? I do not know. Matthew 7, 13. Go in through the narrow gate, for the gate that leads to destruction is wide and the road broad and many travel it. The wide road, the wide gate leads to what? Oh, wait, let me read that again. Go through the narrow gate for the gate that leads to do, that leads to living forever and burning and being tortured in fire. No, it's not what it says. The road that leads to destruction is wide and the road broad and many travel it. If you're a sinner and unrepentant and not receiving Christ into your heart today, you're not going to be tortured forever in a fiery hell. I could say that to scare you, to give me money or to join my ministry, be part of my church or whatever I wanted to do. But I wouldn't do that. Your ultimate destruction is going to be a complete death. Just like it said here in the words of Jesus. Romans 9.22. Now what if God, even though he is quite willing to demonstrate his anger and make known his power, patiently put up with people who deserve punishment and were ripe for destruction? People deserve punishment and were ripe for being tortured forever in fire and screaming out and asking for a drop of water and not getting it and yelling and screaming and people in heaven hearing them and them just being ignored because God doesn't care how much they're suffering. No, it doesn't say that. I don't know why we believe that. It says they deserve punishment. They were right for destruction. Destruction. That's right. It's what a fire does. It burns you up. It destroys you. It doesn't torture you forever. First Philippians 1.28, not frightened by anything that opposition does, this will be for them an indication that they are headed for destruction and you for deliverance. And this is from God. Uh, so the main part here, this will be for them an indication that they are headed for destruction and you for deliverance. So there's two choices here. If you're rejecting God, you're headed for destruction. If you're with God, you're heading for deliverance. You're going to be del delivered from destruction because at the end of human history, you are going to be raised from the dead and you're going to stand before God and he's going to say your sins are forgiven. You believe in Jesus Christ. You've done well, my good and faithful servant. Enter into this paradise that I prepared for you. But if you don't believe, you're going to be destroyed. 2 Philippians 3.29. Now, I'm repeating the same thing over and over. You know why? Because the Bible repeats the same thing over and over. Please listen to the Bible. That's all I'm doing today is reading verses. Ah, they're headed for destruction. Their God is the belly. Now, I know that. My, my belly can be a God to me. I have a terrible addiction to food and eating, overeating. It's one of my great downfalls. So when it says their God is their belly, I think about that a lot when I overeat. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their belly. They are proud of what they ought to be ashamed of since they are concerned about the things of this world. 
So it's once again talking about the evil people, people who reject God. They're proud of things that they should be ashamed of. Don't we hear that all the time? People bragging about doing things that are shameful. And it says right at the beginning of the verse, they are headed for destruction. Second Thessalonians, uh, Second Thessalonians 1 9. They will suffer the just penalty of eternal destruction, far away from the face of the Lord and the glory of his might. You're going to be separated from God, you're going to be destroyed. It's a destruction that's eternal. There's no coming back from it. It's an eternal destruction. There's no coming back. Now, when I die, I'm going to be dead, but I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Because God is going to raise me from the dead. And then he's going to take me into his kingdom. But these people have eternal destruction. There's no coming back. There's no more chances. It's too late. It's going to be a very sad day. The Bible says there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth on that day. The great regret and sorrow people feel because they rejected Jesus Christ and are facing destruction. 2 Thessalonians 2.10 he will enable him to deceive in all kinds of wicked ways those who are headed for destruction because they would not receive the love of the truth and could have saved them. Talk about deception, deception of the ones who are outwardly Christian. You know, there's a great Christian religion in the world today. And like every other religion, it is a false religion. And it's talking here about these false Christians who are going to believe lies. Listen to this again. He will be able, it's talking about the evil ruler of the world, Satan and his representative, the beast, he will be able to deceive in all kinds of wicked ways. He's going to deceive, he's going to fool people, he's going to lie. In all kinds of wicked ways, people who are headed for destruction, once again, destruction. Because they would not receive the love of the truth that could have saved them. If you love the truth, the truth will save you. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. I hope today that your heart is open. And I hope that you can hear the truth of these verses that I'm reading to you today. 2 Peter 2.12 But these people, acting without thinking like animals without reason, born to be captured and destroyed, insult things about which they have no knowledge. When they are destroyed, their destruction will be total. Destroyed, total destruction. Once again, I could keep, keep on going and going. Uh, Isaiah 34.5 For the sword is... Drunk is filled in heaven, now it descends on Edom to judge them, the people I have doomed to their destruction. Romans 6, 21, what fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed for the end of those things is death. The end of those things is not eternal torture in the flames of hell. The, 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 the ultimate goal for these people, the ultimate place they're going to reside is just in death. And I could just go on and on. I mean, I, I don't know how many verses I should read you. I mean, for every verse that you can come up with that supports your, your false beliefs, I can show you ten that say exactly the same thing about the human soul not being immortal, about all humans dying, and if you reject Christ, being destroyed. 1 Corinthians 1.10, God delivered us from so great a death, and that deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. God delivered us from so great a death. Once again, same thing. James 5.20, uh, oh yeah, I read this earlier, he that converteth the sinner from error of his way shall save his soul from death. Remember, eternal life is a gift, that whoever believes in, in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 Timothy 1.10, God saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own pur purpose of grace which he gave us in Jesus Christ before the ages began, which now has been manifested through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who abolished death and brought forth life and immortality to life through the gospel. Eternal life and immortality only comes through faith in Jesus Christ. If you are without Jesus Christ, you will be destroyed. You will die. And that's just the end of that. Humans are not immortal. I hope today you can reject your pagan beliefs. I hope you can reject the preaching of many ministers and just read the Bible and see what it has to say. You are not immortal. You're not going to live forever unless you receive the gift of eternal life. Today, would you like to receive the gift of eternal life? Call out on the name of the Lord today and receive his light and his life 
and you can live forever in his presence. Next week, I'll be talking about death and resurrection. These sermon series are going in a certain order that you can learn one fact and build upon the next and build upon the next until you've come to some better conclusions. Death and resurrection is what the Bible teaches about the afterlife, not immortality. Well, God bless you. I hope you open your mind today. I hope you've learned something new, and I hope you're going to change your beliefs. And I'll see you next week.